Let's see. Hi guys. Well, hello, 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 everybody. What I wanted to do tonight was turn off the, the comments, but that ain't looking like it's gonna happen. So let's go. Ready? One, two, one, two, three. Life can be scary and sometimes hard. It's like you got a winning hand until you dealt the wrong card. It ain't fair, but you're not alone. Down and out, or high and dry, in the darkest valley or the coldest night, you're fine. Not alone with a song bubbling in your heart. Where a story can give you a brand new start. You don't have to travel this big bad world all on your own. Cause it's better when we do together. All mixed up and upside down feels like there's no one else around that ain't right. Been knocked down and the weeds are rough, you just fight. Cause you're not alone with the song buzzing in your soul. Where a story can make you feel whole. You don't have to travel this big bad world all on your own. Cause it's better when we do it together. so scary and you're feeling all on your own just remember there is a place that you can call you can call home I'm just riffing now now I'm just having fun. Welcome to the Palaha Chautauqua, everybody. This is Christopher Palaha. Hello. And we're live. We are live. Um, what I wanted to do tonight was to turn off the comments section. I don't know how. Does anybody know how to do that? Okay. Here's what I'm going to do, guys. I just found out. I'm going to turn off commenting, and then I'm going to turn it back on at the end of the show. Boink. Ready, go. There we go. So the reason I'm doing this tonight is because I'm going to kind of do it differently. Um, if you've been a fan of the Palaha Chautauqua, if you've been watching for the past four months, then you know that we have been working on something called the Fruits of the Spirit. We're talking about the full expression of the human existence. And it is culminating tonight in a 15-page essay that I wrote over the past two weeks about love. And it's a really special show and it's a very vulnerable show for me because I want to take you to a very personal place that I've never done in my life before. Um, but I want, to, I want to share this because it is my heart and love is the heart. And it's been a crazy week and it's funny when you know, you're trying to do something and you feel like everything's coming in at you. And so I think there's a reason for, for this uh, and for that. Um, so I'm going to keep the comments off to the end of the show, at which point I'll turn them on. You could all say hello at the end, and you can wish each other a Merry Christmas. So hang tight to the end, and you'll be able to see everybody and say hi. Um, and here is a little public announcement. I am going to stop doing the Palaha Chautauquas for the holiday season. So I know that we were going to do a Share Your Gifts on the 27th, which was a lovely idea. And if you've been preparing something, and if you were looking forward to doing that and sharing something that you have, a gift that you have, um, I will do another one in January, and we could do it in January. But in the meantime, if you want to do the, the Palaha Chautauqua theme song and send it to me um, at that contact at chrispalaha.com, I will download it. I'll post it back here. I'll, uh, I could do If you do it on your Instagram thing, I can just obviously um, replay that because I think that's a fun way um, to share your gifts. And then also it's just fun to see what people are doing. Um, so I am going to take a little break. I'm taking off until January... Um, the mid, the second, the, it'll be the two Sundays off in January. So the third Sunday in January, I'll jump back on. Okay. So it'll be two weeks in January and then we'll keep going every week. Um, and then I have a, a shameless plug. I have to shamelessly plug something. I'm, I'm mixing business and pleasure tonight. Um, Wonder Woman, 1984, 
uh, please do yourself a favor. I know you guys love me in Hallmark movies, and if you love me in Hallmark movies because they are feel-good and inspirational and uplifting, I promise you, you will. this is like a Hallmark film on steroids in a way you've never experienced before with Wonder Woman as your leading lady. Um, Patty Jenkins is the director who's got nothing but heart. Gal Gadot, who is obviously Wonder Woman, has nothing but heart. They're both Wonder Women. So and you, you might even catch a little old glimpse of me in the movie. Um, so, on with the show, yeah? Um, a few folks turned out... Uh, oh, oh, also, I wanted to say thank you to everybody in the Palahash Taco community who showed up uh, last week at the Cordella, Cordellera Film Festival. It was awesome. I'm involved in a little film festival. It's actually international from my hometown, Reno, Nevada. And there was a huge turnout from you guys, which is massive and extremely supportive. And it's putting all of this stuff into action, which I am so grateful for. And I've also received a ton of letters this week. Um, I think last week's show on joy elicited a feeling of like, I don't know what it was, but I got an outpouring of letters from you guys um, thanking me for the positive effects this community has had on your life. Um, people have claimed to have, they've stopped feeling depression. Um, they feel uplifted, they feel joy and peace and all of the things that we've been talking about. And maybe it's because they've been thinking about these things and meditating on these things. Um, and Stephanie talked about little Annika who has never been a public person and who is being like vocal and uh, joining FaceTime Live and, and, and talking and looking at things. And so there's this awesome growth. Um, and all I can say about that is I wish I could be like, oh yeah, score. Um, <laughs> again, I pushed the button in March and it's just snowballing into this beautiful thing called the Palashitaka, which is a living organism and a social experiment, which I've talked about before, and it continues to grow week by week. Um, and all I can say is I think that the Palashitaka is striking a chord somewhere between church and theater. We're being re fed real spiritual meat by the topics each week and by your candid stories, by the things that you guys talk about and share. And, um, I think it's a bit like theater where at any moment I can push this live button and all of a sudden you, so if I wanted to go live with somebody, uh, it just sends all these nerves and everyone's like, Ooh, okay, hold on a second. I'm so ready to talk. Cause you get to call me. Um, and you get to go live in front of hundreds of people and it's exciting and it makes you a bit nervous and it's fun. So theater, when it is done right by the right people, it is famous for helping people find confidence and emerge out of their shells. And church, when it is done right with the right people, is famous for helping people find community and wisdom. And not least of all, God's love. Speaking of love, let's get on with the show. So the theme of the Palaha Chautauqua from day one has been storytelling. And it's the idea that telling your story can help you make it through tough times. Right? Being heard, but also the way that we shape our narrative determines how we are seen by others and how we see ourselves. So if we play the victim in our own story, if I'm always the victim, well, then I become a victim in my life. But if I play the survivor, then all of a sudden I become a hero in my story and I become a hero in my own life. So the words that we say, the things that we speak, that start with the thoughts that we have about ourselves, but eventually everything that comes out of our mouth helps shape our narrative. So to that, everything we say, every single word we utter is an attempt to shape our own narrative from the bragging that we do, that imprints on the listener the good things about us that we want them to know, to the complaining that we do, which tells the listener the things that we do not like and that we are not, right? We share our hopes and dreams almost daily to anyone who will listen, even if, in, in, within the most banal exchanges in the things we say, we speak to express what we want. Our desires define who we are. So if we want to double-double with fries, and we're like, hey, I want to double-double the fries, we're defining ourselves as hungry meat eaters. It's a part of our narrative. So acting, it's what I do for a living, right? I'm, I tell stories with emotions, movement, words, and sometimes with music. An actor's job is to tell a story with their whole body and voice and emotions to convey the theme of the writer's story. Now, most stories, they follow a pretty common path, right? A hero is called to action. The hero reluctantly sets out on a journey of self-discovery, encounters conflict, faces death, and in a battle, proves himself, changes for the better, and perhaps saves the world in the process. Happy endings abound. 
Now, as an actor, my goal is to clearly and boldly tell this story while reminding the audience of the overall themes as often as possible through actions or looks or emoting. And the one way that I do this, there's a little actor trick called playing objectives. An objective is to play a verb, like to play, to seduce, to overpower, right? And I play objectives by asking myself, what does my character want in this scene? Now, there was a great teacher that I had once named Earl Gister. And he once told me that every, every objective can be broken down into two main objectives, okay? So everything that I want to achieve from another character that I'm on stage with can be achieved by playing one of two things, to love that person or to hate that person. This was his thesis, this was his theory, and I tested it, and it's been kind of amazing. I love it, in fact. Um, so to hate the other character or to love the other character, to love or to hate that every interaction in a movie or on a stage can be broken down to these two very simple yet entirely powerful objectives. To love that other person or to hate that other person. Now as an actor, I've seen how my work translates into my everyday life. When I go into the world, I'm constantly wanting things from people, people who I share my home with, um, but also strangers at the market or in a line. I have objectives, like I want my son Jude to finish his homework, or I want to have a moment with my wife, or I want my team to find me a cool job, or very simply, I want to buy a cup of coffee. You know, <laughs> I want things from people, right? Speaking of, <clears throat> and people are often at the other end of, of those desires these very simple wants. And I have a thousand different ways that I can achieve my objective. I can bully my way, right? I can say, give me the coffee, give me the coffee, give me the coffee. I can yell, I can beg, oh, come on, please, I just want a coffee. I can seduce, like, hey, you, uh, you got some coffee I can have? It's a terrible seduction. I can plea, I can force, I can charm, come on, give me some coffee. I can be humble, I can overpower, right? But among all those verbs, it boils down to two things. I can love that person and get my coffee, or I can hate that person and get my coffee, maybe. So, what if, as an actor, I chose to make, to love, the main objective behind every decision I make? I tell you what, it would make for some compelling action, even when the script doesn't support it. Especially when the script doesn't support it. To love. To love. Because, I will argue, that love is the greatest power in the universe. So I ask you this, if you made the decision to love everyone you came in contact with, even when the script of your life doesn't support it, even when the people who are in contact with you disagree with them, right? I think that you will behave in a very different way. If you choose to make loving people your only objective, you will not only be a great actor, if you chose to be an actor, you will be a genius as a human being. You will live a life so full, so rich, so beautiful, that you will become a beacon for everyone you encounter. Your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, your coworkers, the people who serve you, the people who you serve. Strangers will smell a fragrance on you that is a heavenly scent and through you, I promise you this, through you they will meet God. Because God is love. Webster defines love as a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. Webster has a ton to say about love. And we're going to go through all of them because it's so interesting to me. So like a maternal love for a child. Attraction based on sexual desire, affection, and tenderness felt by lovers. After all these years, they are still very much in love. Affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interests. A love for his old schoolmates. An assurance of affection. Please give her my love. Um, warm attachment, enthusiasm, or devotion. A love of the sea. I have a love of the stage. The object, the object of attachment, devotion, or admiration. Baseball was his first love. A beloved person, like darling, often used as a term of endearment, like hello, my love. Um, British is used as an informal term of address. Love, Billy. 
Uh, unselfish, loyal, and benevolent. Concern for the good of another, such as a fatherly concern of God for humankind. Brotherly concern for others. A person's adoration of God, a God, such as Eros, a, or a personification of love. An amorous episode or a love affair, a sexual embrace or copulation. A score of zero, as in the game of tennis, love, 15. Uh, love is a verb, which is where I like it. Loved, loving, definition of love, to hold dear, to cherish, to feel a lover's passion, to feel devotion, to feel tenderness, to caress, to touch amorously, to like or desire actively, to take pleasure in, loved to play the violin, to thrive in, the roses love sunlight, to feel affection or experience or desire. Synonyms are affection, attachment, devotedness, devotion, fondness, passion, Synonyms for the verb are to appreciate, to cherish, to prize, to treasure, to value. Say that again, to appreciate, to cherish, to prize, to treasure, to value. The antonyms are abomination, hate, hatred, loathing, rancor, and a verb. The antonym is the verb is to disvalue. So there are different types of love. Like the Inuits famously have a thousand words for snow. We have several meanings for one word. So I went online and Christians are famous for saying there's three types of love. There's the philia, there's the eros, and there's the agape. But I went in and apparently there's eight different types of love. And we'll go through that real quick. Philia is a love without romantic attraction. It occurs between friends or family members. It occurs when both people share the same values and respect each other. It commonly referred to as brotherly love. So it's commonly referred to as brotherly love. Uh, your mind articulates which friends are on the same wavelength as you and you and who you can trust. And the ways that you show a philia type of love is you engage in deep conversation with a friend. You be open and you're trustworthy. You be supportive in hard times. Now, pragma is a unique bonded love that matures over many years. It's an everlasting love between a couple that chooses to put equal effort into their friendship. Commitment and dedication required to reach pragma. Instead of falling in love, you are standing in love with your partner that you want by your side indefinitely. The subconscious drives partners towards each other. This feeling comes unknowingly and feels purposeful. And how you show pragma is you continue to strengthen the bond of a long-term relationship. You, she you seek and show effort with your partner. You choose to work with your partner forever. Now, storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, is a naturally occurring love rooted in parents and children as well as best friends. It's an infinite love built upon acceptance and deep emotional connection. This love comes easily and immediately in parent-child relationships. Your memories encourage long-lasting bonds with another individual. And as you create more memories, the value of relationship increases. And how you show storage is that you sacrifice your time, yourself, your personal pleasures. You quickly forgive harmful actions. You share memorable and impactful moments. Now, eros. Eros is a primal love that comes as natural as a natural instinct for most people. It's a passionate love displayed through physical affection. These romantic behaviors include, but are not limited to, kissing, hugging, holding hands. This love is a desire for another person's physical body. Your hormones awaken a fire in your body and you must be satisfied with romantic actions from an admired partner. You show Eros by admiring someone's physical body, by physical touch, such as hugging and kissing, romantic affection. Now, Ludus, Ludus, L-U-D-U-S, is a childlike and flirtatious love commonly found in the beginning stages of a relationship, aka the honeymoon stage. This type of love consists of teasing, playful motives, and laughter between two people. Although common in young couples, older couples who strive for this love find a more rewarding relationship. Your emotions allow you to feel giddy, excited, interested, and involved with another person. And how you show ludus is you flirt and engage in whimsical conversation. You spend time together to laugh and have fun. Exemplify childlike behavior together. Now, philatuia, if P-H-I-L-A-U-T-I-A. It's a healthy form of love where you recognize your own self-worth and you don't ignore your own personal needs. Self-love. 
and it begins with acknowledging your responsibility for your well-being. It's challenging to exemplify the outward types of love because you can't offer what you don't have. Your soul always, your soul allows you to reflect on your necessary needs and physical, emotional, and mental health. How do you show this self-love? You create an environment that nurtures your well-being. Take care of yourself like a parent would care for a child. Spend time around people who support you. And finally, we have agape, right? And agape, Christians love agape love. Agape is the highest level of love to offer. It is given without any expectations of receiving anything in return. So I'm going to I'm going to say that again. Agape love is given without any expectations of receiving anything in return. Offering agape is the decision to spread love in any circumstances, including destructive situations. Agape is not a physical act, it's a feeling. But acts of self-love can elicit agape since self-control or self-monitoring leads to results. And we've talked about this, the results of peace and patience and kindness and joy and gentleness and faithfulness. So you see it's all starting to circle in, right? All of this in your artwork this week on the Chautauqua has been amazing because you've tied, you've loved as this anchor which ties all the other fruits together creating one right? It's one thing. Your spirit creates purpose bigger than yourself. It motivates you to pass kindness on to others. And that, my friends, is the whole point of kingdom living. It's a purpose-led life, and the purpose is to love others, right? So how do you show agape? You dedicate your life to improving the lives of others. Stay conscious of your actions for the good of humankind and offer your time and your charity to someone in need. Now, I said a little bit ago that God is love, which it's a wonderful old adage, but it also happens to be scripture that God is love. It's found in John's first letter, and it's something that people repeat a lot of times and they don't even know that it's scripture. But God is love. Think about that. God is love. God is mentioned 4,000, or a reference to, 4,473 times in the Bible which is the only book that you know, lets us know his heart, right? This thing. So what if we replaced the word God with the word love each time? Love said, let there be light. Love said it was good. So I started doing some digging on, online and I found an article, this is not mine, <clears throat> this is written by a woman named Mandy Spears, M-A-N-D-Y-S-P-E-A-R-S, and I found it on medium.com, which is M-E-D-I-U-M.com, which is, it's like a cool website if you want to go. It lets you find everything you ever wanted to see. Um, and she had an interesting take on replacing the word God with love. And I wasn't going to read the whole thing, but I was working on my time here, and I, I am going to read it all to you. So Mandy Spears wrote, when I taught in high school, there was a prayer class offered to juniors and seniors as a religion elective. I taught it all five years, but one particular class session from my first year of teaching stands out to me the most and laid the foundation for an exercise I would walk my students through when it seemed like they needed it. A student was asking the tough questions, questions having to do with theodicy and the way that humans manipulate statements about God to give them authority to treat other people terribly. Her questions were about people who do terrible things to others in the name of the Christian God and how it doesn't make sense. So we talked about having consistent theologies and how a lot of people don't have consistent theologies at all and how that can be damaging and require a bit of mental gymnastics and intellectual dishonesty in order to hold it. We decided that we wanted to have personal theologies that were consistent, but how could we check it? So Mandy had her students write out their tough questions. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? We tossed all of the questions into a box, shook it and pulled them out one by one and read them aloud. But we replaced the word God with the word love. Why does love hate particular groups of people? It doesn't. Love cannot hate. It goes against the very definition. We decided those statements are nonsense. Why does love let bad things happen to good people? We talked about how no matter how much our parents love us, we still fall off our bicycles. We are still bullied. 
Love is powerful, but love can't stop us from feeling the pain that comes with the laws of nature or all of the choices we and others make. Love can, however, help us heal. I ask my students to write down beliefs they had about God or beliefs they've heard from others about God, whether they agree with them or not. We did the same thing, replaced the word God with the word love and waited to see if the statement would still make sense. If it did, maybe we could hold it. And if it didn't make sense, we decided it was nonsense and let it go for now. I know this is a practice that can be easily altered to fit someone's personal needs or motives. Lots of Christians claim that God lets us hurt to teach us things. If you replace God with love, it's a claim that love lets us hurt to teach us things, which is both loving and unloving, depending on situation and perspective. And then Mandy goes on to say, I think perhaps we just get hurt and love teaches us things. It may take some of the power and authority away from God slash love, but it gives God slash love a power and authority that has to do with redemption more than with causing pain to teach a lesson when we could have learned a lesson painlessly. I'm going to pause here. Um, I once played this guy named Charles Templeton in a movie called Billy the Early Years with Army Hammer, who played Billy Graham. And the whole point of the movie was Billy Graham's conversion into Christianity and Charles Templeton's uh, walk away from faith. And he had this monologue, and I urge you to go rent this movie. It's called Billy the Early Years, only for this one scene um, where Charles and Billy are talking. He says, if God, how did God... You know, he went and walked around Europe after World War II, and he walked, he walked through Dresden. And he said, how does a loving God allow Dresden to happen? Or, you know, the chambers filled with Jewish people to be incinerated. Like, how does a loving God allow that? So there's this huge sort of philosophical divide of if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, then why does a hurricane happen? Why does a plague happen? Why do things happen? So that's just a little side note. Back to Mandy's letter. Now, this is still a practice I do now on my own. Whenever I hear a claim about God that rubs me the wrong way, if I can't replace God with love, I give myself permission to let that claim go. Sometimes I give myself permission to wrestle with it a bit, see all the implications and possible meanings. But it's okay to disagree with someone else about God. We all know God in different ways. We all have different lenses through which we see God and the world. And then she writes, I just want my lens to always be shaped by a God who is love. So, back to me, back to the Palaha Chautauqua. Um, so we've talked about peace and kindness and patience and gentleness being actions. That there are things that we have to do on our end to manifest those qualities in our lives. And I will argue that love is an action, not a feeling or an emotion. And is best exemplified, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. There's a lot of translations and there's a lot of more beautiful translations than that, but there is that greater love hath no one greater than this, someone who will lay down his life for his friends, which Christ <laughs> Jesus did on his own accord for all of those who believe in him alone. Now I could go as far as to say that the act of loving someone becomes an act of worship to our loving God. It's like a mirror reflecting light. Hence, in short, our purpose. When I love you, regardless, it's not me, I'm doing the work of loving, but the love comes from God woof, through me to you. So guys, I have decided that since it's Christmas time, I'm gonna go ahead and read um, I'm going to go ahead and read out of this book and all these little tassels. So bear with me. We're 29 minutes into the Chautauqua. I've got a little bit of time. And I'm going to pop through and read a bunch of different stuff. And I'm going to tell you guys a story. Okay? And it is the story of Jesus. Because I think at Christmas it's important to hear this. And I'm going to read from Matthew, Luke, John, and Revelation. So just sit tight. Get a hot cocoa. Get your phone, airplay it up to the TV, relax. And I'm sorry that I'm looking down a lot, but I am reading. Um, and I'm going to go for it, okay? So, the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus took place like this. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Before they came to the marriage bed, Joseph discovered that she was pregnant. It was by the Holy Spirit, but he didn't know that. Joseph, chagrined but noble, determined to take care of things quietly so Mary would not be disgraced. While he was trying to figure a way out, he had a dream. God's angel spoke in the dream. Joseph, son of David, don't hesitate to get married. 
Mary's pregnancy is spirit conceived. God's Holy Spirit has made her pregnant. She will bring a son to birth, and when she does, you, Joseph, will name him Jesus. God saves, because he will save his people from their sins. This would bring the prophet's embryonic sermon to full term. Watch for this. A virgin will get pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, Hebrew, for God is with us. Then, Jesus, then Joseph woke up. He did exactly what God's angel commanded in the dream. He married Mary, but he did not consummate the marriage until she had the baby. He named the baby Jesus. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, Judah territory, this was during Herod kingship, a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east. They asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? We observed a star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth. We're on a pilgrimage to worship him. They said this to Herod, who said, go find this child, leave no stone unturned. As soon as you find him, Send word, and I'll join you at once in your worship. Instructed by the king, they set off. Then the star appeared again. The same star that they had seen in the eastern skies. It led them on until it hovered over the place of the child. They could hardly contain themselves. They were in the right place. They had arrived at the right time. They entered the house and saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshipped him. Then they opened their luggage and presented gifts of frankincense and myrrh and gold. In a dream, they were warned not to report back to Herod, so they worked out another route, left the territory without being seen, and returned to their own country. Now, John's, uh, sorry, Luke's um, depiction of the birth is just a little different, so I'm going to read you that one too. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiance, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn, she wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood and they had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angel stood among them and God's glory blazed all around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town, a savior who is a Messiah and master. That is what you're looking for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. And at once the angel who was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises, glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. And as the angel choirs withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within her herself. The shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. Now when the eighth day arrived, the day of circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. Then when the days stipulated by Moses for purification were completed, they took him up to Jerusalem to offer him to God as commanded in God's law. Every male who opens the womb shall be a holy offering to God and also to sacrifice the pair of doves or two young pigeons prescribed in God's law. In Jerusalem at the time, there was a man, Simeon by name, a good man, a man who lived the prayerful expectancy, he lived in prayerful expectancy of the help for Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would see the Messiah of God before he died. Led by the Spirit, he entered the temple. As the parents of the child Jesus brought him to carry out the rituals of the law, Simeon took him into his arms and blessed God and said, God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. 
It's now out in the open for everyone to see a God revealing light to the non Jewish nations and of the glory for your own people, Israel. Jesus' father and mother were speechless with surprise at these words. And Jesus got a little older. And every year, Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up, as they always did, for the feast. And when it was over, they left for home. But the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents didn't know it, which I always think is funny. that They're like traveling, and they lost Jesus for a couple days. <laughs> Uh, thinking he was somewhere in the company of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day and then began looking for him among relatives and neighbors. And when they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. The next day they found him in the temple, seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were quiet. They were taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers. But his parents were not impressed. They were upset and they were hurt. His mother said, young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. And he said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. Now I'm going to jump a little ahead. At one point, Jesus was tested by the devil. Now he's all starting to prep up, right? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wild. For 40 wilderness days and nights, he was tested by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when the time was up, he was hungry. The devil, playing on his hunger, gave the first test. Since your God's son commanded this, command this stone to turn into a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy, it takes more than bread to really live. For the second test, he led him up and spread out all the kingdoms of the earth and displayed it once. Then the devil said, they're yours and all their splendor to serve at your pleasure. I'm in charge of all of them and can turn them over to whomever I wish. Worship me and they're yours, the whole works. And Jesus refused again, backing his refusal with Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God. Serve him with absolute single heartedness. For the third test, the devil took him to Jerusalem and put him on the top of the temple. He said, if you are God's son, jump. It's written, isn't it, that he has placed you in the care of angels to protect you. They will catch you and you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. Yes, said Jesus. It's also written, don't you dare tempt the Lord your God. And that completed the testing. The devil retreated temporarily, lying in wait for another opportunity. And then Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been reared as he always did on the Sabbath. He went to the meeting place where he stood to read. He was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor, sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burden and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him intent. And then he started in, You've just heard scripture make history. It came true just now in this place. <clears throat> and once, and I'm gonna start to tell you guys a bunch of stories about God and about Jesus. Like his first miracle was a wedding and the wedding feast had run out of wine and Jesus turned water into wine for a wedding feast at his mother's bequest because he loved his mother but he also loved this union. It would have been disgraceful for that family to not have wine enough, long enough for these long weddings that took place over the course of days. And each story about Jesus is an act of love and his love for us as a humanity. So once he was standing at the shore of Lake um, Gennesaret, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. And he noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them out and were scrubbing their nets. He climbed onto the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put on a little, push out a little from the shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. When he finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deeper water and let your nets out for a catch. And Simon, Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow, but if you say so, I'll let down our nets. It was no sooner said than done, a huge haul of fish straining the nets past capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. You are blessed. Um, oh, hear this. 
One day uh, on the vi in one of the villages, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when Jesus saw, he fell down. And, and when he saw Jesus, he fell down in prayer and said, if you want to, you can cleanse me. But if you want. And Jesus put out his hand, touched him and said, I want, to, I want to be clean. Then and there, his skin was smooth and the leprosy was gone. Another time, he fed 5,000 people with fish. Coming down off the mountain with them, he stood on a plain surrounded by disciples and was soon joined by a huge congregation from all over Judea and Jerusalem, even from the seaside towns of Tyre and Sidon. They had come both to hear him and to be cured of their ailments. Those disturbed by evil spirits were healed. Everyone was trying to touch him and every so much energy surging from him. So many people healed. And then he spoke, you're blessed when you've lost it all. God's kingdom is there for the finding. You're blessed when you're ravenously hungry. Then you're ready for the messianic meal. You're blessed when the tears flow freely. Joy comes with the morning. Right, let me see something here. So Jesus commanded, he did this little prayer here. He said, give away your life, but it's trouble ahead if you think you have it made. What you have is all you'll ever get. And it's trouble ahead if you're satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for long. And it's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. There's suffering to be met and you're gonna meet it. There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. Popularity contests are not truth contests. Look how many scoundrel preachers were approved by your ancestors. Your task is to be true, not popular. To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. Here is a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, you be kind. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down, that hardens, that, that hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life and you'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. Yep. Why are you so polite with me? Uh, yeah. Okay, hang with me here. Hang with me, guys. This is all food. Then he told them what he could expect for themselves. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You are not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to find yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you? There's another version of that. Is what good would it do a man to gain the whole world if he loses his soul? The real you. If any of you is embarrassed with me and the way I'm leading you, Know that the Son of Man will be far more embarrassed with you when he arrives in all his splendor to accompany with the Father and the holy angels. This isn't you realize, pie in the sky by and by, some who have taken their stand right here are going to see it happen. See it with their own eyes, the kingdom of God. This is the living, the kingdom living I'm talking about. 
And Jesus said, first things first, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. And just then a religious scholar came up with a question to test Jesus and said, what do you need to do to get eternal life? And he answered, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. And Jesus said, good answer. Do it and you'll live. And then he says, well, who would you define as my neighbor? And Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him up, and they went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite, a religious man, showed up, but he also avoided the injured man. And then a Samaritan, traveling the road, came on to him. And when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. First, he gave him aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey. He led him to an inn. He made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him, and if it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. So what do you think, Jesus asked, which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. He said, Yeah, go and do the same. And then Jesus says, Asks for what you need. One day he was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said, Master, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so he said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgive others. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. And then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. And an old friend traveling through just showed up. I don't have a thing on hand. And then the friend answered from his bed, don't bother me. The door's locked. My children are all down for the night. I can't give anything to you. But let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand your ground and you knock and you keep knocking, waking up all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and he'll get you what you need. And this is what Jesus is saying. Ask and you'll get it. Seek and you'll find it. Knock and the door will be open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If if a little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as we are, we wouldn't think of doing such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. Don't you think a father who conceived you in love will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him? Okay, how are we doing? We doing okay? All right, and Jesus commanded, even more blessed are those who hear God's word and guard it with their lives. And then Jesus says this. He continued the subject with his disciples. Don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtime or if the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There's far more in your inner life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance and the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the ravens, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, carefree in the care of God. And you count more. Has anyone, by fussing before the mirror, even gotten an inch taller? If fussing can't even do that, why fuss at all? Walk into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They don't fuss with their appearance. But have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside of them. If God gives such attention to the wilderness, most of them never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you, do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, not to be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond by giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep yourself in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Do not be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Be generous. Give to the poor. Give yourselves a bank that can't go bankrupt. A bank in heaven, far from bank robbers, safe from embezzlers. A bank you can bank on. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place where you will most want to be and end up being. Now Jesus not only performed these incredible miracles that expressed love, 
and said these incredible things that teach us how to love each other. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. He did something that is the greatest act of love in the history of mankind. And the minute this thing was done, it changed human history. It changed the way that we, in the hierarchy of what it means to be a human being. And that is that he got on a cross on Golgotha and he died for us. He died for our sins. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And then three days later, he rose again. He said, this is, he said, everything I told you while I was with you comes to this. All the things written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and all the Psalms have to be fulfilled. He went on to open their understanding of the word of God, showing them how to read their Bibles this way. He said, you can see how it is written that the Messiah suffers, rises from the dead on the third day, and that a total life change through the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed in his name to all nations, starting from here, from Jerusalem. You're the first to hear it and see it. You're the witnesses. What comes next is very important. I'm sending what my father promised to you, so stay here in the city until he arrives, until you are equipped from power on high. And then he led them out in the city over to Bethany, raising his hands, he blessed them, and while blessing them, he took his leave, being carried up to heaven. And they were on their knees. They returned to Jerusalem, busting with joy. They spent all their time in the temple praising God. Yes. I have here from water to wine. <clears throat> and then I, they took him away, carrying him. And early in the morning, the resurrection is this beautiful thing. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, breathing, breathlessly panting. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they put them. Both Marys stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she knelt to look into the, womb, the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head and the other at the foot where Jesus' body had been laid. And they said to her, Woman, why do you weep? And then she said, They took my master, and I don't know where they put him. And after this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Mister, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. And then Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she saw, said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. And I love that he appeared to this woman first. And the way that John ends to me is so beautiful. So there's the water into wine. He calms the storm down and has power over the natural elements. He feeds 5,000 people with two, bread, two loaves of bread and a piece of fish and has baskets left. And at the end of John, it says there are so many other things that Jesus did. If they were all written down, each of them, one by one, I can't imagine a world big enough to hold such a library of books. So there is this unfathomable amount of miracles that Jesus did. And of course, there's 1 Corinthians that talks about love, being kind, patient, not keeping record, not keeping score. And you can dig that out, and people have. Um, but I do want to read this last little piece to you from Revelations. And this is one of the coolest things about Jesus that I know. I saw heaven and earth new created. Gone, the first heaven. Gone, the first earth. Gone, the sea. I saw holy Jerusalem new created, descending resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for her husband. I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look. God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They're his people. He's their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The throned continued. Look, I'm making everything new. He's making everything new. Hey, Caleb, if you're watching, you want to head in here? So I have taken you, thank you guys for listening to that. <clears throat> I have taken you this far, but if I don't give you the vaccine, the secret that I know, I'll be selling you in this entire semester short. So, because it's like taking, tasting fresh water if you've lived your whole life drinking salt water. The Christ narrative is a story that you can claim over your life. And remember how I said a narrative can determine how we are seen and how we see the world? 
Well, this story sets you free. It breaks every chain, it removes every stain. It makes you brand new. And it gives you strength and a fearlessness. I also read in Matthew that, about the wise men who followed the star. If you're a Christian, we, I believe, if you are a Christian, that we are called to be that star in the Christmas story. The star that wise men followed to find the Christ baby. The star shining in the night sky, leading people to the savior of the world. Now our friend Seb on the Chautauqua, she reached out to me in November and she asked me a question and I'm quoting it verbatim. She said, hey Chris, I have a question if it's okay to ask. When do you think a person can call themselves a Christian? Like how far into a journey of finding faith does someone have to be? Or is it just a case of it feels right? Because watching the Chautauqua last night, thinking about the faith I have now, I thought of myself as a Christian, but I don't know if there are rules that need to be met first. <laughs> And I love that question because it's such a childlike, beautiful question. So now I'm going to ask you this. If you have walked down this road with me for the last four months and you don't know Jesus, but you would like to know him, or even if you already do know Jesus and you just want to double down in your commitment to him, it is so simple. It's so easy. All you have to do is make a decision in your heart, with your mind, and let him into your life and let him just become the king of your life and start living in his kingdom. And all you have to do to do that is to say a simple prayer. You could say it, I'll say it, you repeat after me. Jesus, I would like to know you. I would like to have you in my life. I want to live in your kingdom. I am broken. I'm asking forgiveness and I am sorry. So you're asking for forgiveness of sins. I know that you make all things new. And today, right now, forevermore, I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It is literally as simple as that. Uh, it takes practice, like any practice. If you're practicing yoga or you're practicing piano, you want to be a good Christian, you got to read the Bible. You got to get in fellowship with other Christians so you can talk about things because you're going to have a ton of questions. You are going to feel attacked. You're going to feel shame and guilt for the things you've done in your life, and you're going to feel inadequate. But what you're doing is building a relationship with a loving God and you're naming it Jesus. And you're given this book to read, which is going to weaponize your faith with wisdom and, and knowledge. And you're going to have strength and power. And a lot of your questions are going to be answered. And the, the Bible can be, if it's King James or if it's NIJ, but this Eugene H. Peterson, the message uh, he writes it in a way that's just really comprehensible and graspable. Um, it's it's the, the more you read his word, the better you get at knowing him, the deeper your relationship will become, and the more real his love will feel in your life. And again, this is by no means a promise from pain, but this relationship that if you can claim this story of over your life, I promise you, dudes, you will be set free. And you will have an inheritance. You will feel like a rich kid with a really, really rich dad who is going to give this inheritance to you. And there's like a, a freedom with which you will move through the world. And every problem you have, every issue you have, whether it's a mental one or a physical one or a spiritual one, you just take it to the cross and say, Jesus, I can't do this. I'm done. I want you to take it for me, Christ. And Jesus will take it. I promise you, I've lived it. Uh, it's been an amazing, and, and the only reason I'm able to do what I'm doing with you is because I've been in relationship. And when I was a baby boy, my parents, they just, I had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Holy Spirit. I would pray for wisdom and I would pray to be in God's love and his grace. And, and I left that relationship when I was 17. I think I told you guys this. And I wandered through the wilderness for six years and I studied Buddhism and, and uh, the Muslim faith, the Jewish faith. I went around the world on a boat and studied world religions. And I kept coming back, Jesus kept coming back to me in dreams and, and people. Um, and I've always been super shy about my faith as an actor because Hollywood, you know, there's, there's a divide between Hollywood and, and, and speaking about faith, um, which I'm hoping slowly to change because I think a great story is a great story. Um, so I don't do this often. I'm 43 years old and I've never had uh, the boldness to share this intimately, my faith so publicly, but it is Christmas and I can't think of a better gift to give you guys um, now more than ever. And I do want to say, remember, 
that the Palaha Shatakwa, every single human being, no matter who you are, no matter what you are, how you, like, what you believe, you are welcome here. This is an open community, welcome to everybody. Because at the end of the day, my faith believes that we are all equal, that God made every single human being on this planet and loves us all. He just wants to know you all. That's the deal. He just wants to meet you. And when you meet him, what you decide to do with that, that's up to you and him. And that's it. And our jobs as Christian is to, in the most beautiful possible way, just kindly introduce people to him, not in an obnoxious way, not in an over your head kind of way. And so forgive me if I hit you on the head today. And I hope I didn't. I don't think I did. Um, and if you did say yes tonight, Go ahead, and if you prayed that prayer with me, hit your little heart button right now. I want to just take an idea I can see. Um, if you did say yes tonight, and you invited love into your heart, the kingdom is at hand. It's right here. It's right now, and it's time to start living and to bring heaven onto earth so that when people meet you, they feel God's love, and they know that he's real because of you, because you are the body. And there's something amazing afoot in this world. I can feel it. And I know that there's an amazing thing. I'm going to turn on my chats. Um, I'm going to let you guys. Um, I'm going to let you guys. Uh oh, hold on. I'm going to let you guys comment. Turn on commenting. Hello. Hello, everybody. And I'm going to let my son play you a song because he wrote this awesome thing. So just chill and say hi to each other. And Caleb, I'm going to let you take it away, brother. All righty. <clears throat>
died at least a hundred times And I know it might seem boring But it just might change your life Yeah, when you dance with angels You know there's something going on Hearts filled with pain and anger Healed by the Son of God Yeah, when you dance with angels You know there's something going on Hearts filled with pain and anger I mean, isn't that awesome? I got like a I got like a stud in my house who can jam. Hey, can I have your guitar still? Oh yeah. <laughs> this guy make an album, right? We we'll get a get a Kickstarter fund going and get him an album. How about that? Um, guys, if you made this decision tonight, I would love to know. Let me know. Um, I love. I was it all these and. Um, and Merry Christmas, and thank you so much for your support of the Palaha Chautauqua. Um, again, if you bought stuff this year, the merchandise, um, there's a lot of people who are like, I missed it because it was like a week thing, a uh, one week thing. I will do another fundraiser um, in the spring, give it some time, and we'll do another one. And um, if you did make that decision tonight, I'm proud of you. And and I am curious. Uh, it, it'll change your life forever. It did mine. And um, I will miss you guys. I'm going to sign off. And I'm actually going to stay off of the internet uh, until after my son Jude's birthday, which is the 4th of January. So I'm not going to be DMing. And I'm not going to be checking things. And I'm not going to be uh, I'm not gonna be on my, on my social media or my phone for the next couple of weeks. Because I really just want to kind of take a step back and... And I have a huge group of people I'm not living by myself. And so um, I don't use social media to keep in touch with people. So this isn't a comment on that because I think this community provides a big safe space and, and, and social media in general is just a way to stay connected. So, but um, I need to disconnect. So that's what I'll be doing. So if you don't hear from me, that's why. And um, I will see you guys real, real soon. Um, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Oh, and I'm sending out um, little things. If you are a finalist in the great Palaha Chautauqua art contest, um, expect a little something in the mail from me. Um, a little piece of artwork on, from, from, uh, from me. <laughs> Just checking out everybody's messages here. I'm doing this is because your your messages disappear when um, I post this thing, so I never can see. What anyone says. All right, that's it. Okay, guys.
I will see you all next year. Have an amazing Christmas. Happy New Year. God bless you all. Lord Jesus, I lift up this entire community. Anybody who's watching live right now, who's going to watch it and forever and wherever it posts from here on out. And I just pray that you are the king of their world, that they will know you and love you and that they will serve you and that you will work in their life, whether or not even for the people who, who, who don't claim you as their, as their Lord and Savior, that, the, that you will still rock the people's worlds who are watching this in the best way. Um, I pray for safety and health and encouragement and a spirit of joy and love this holiday season for everybody watching. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, guys. Bye-bye.